Hey guys, across our campuses, can we praise God for the progress and what we're seeing happen? Um, man, I want to say this very quickly, y'all. I know that we already prayed over this, but uh, all of the indicators that we have from people that are high up uh, in disaster relief and, and services and things like that are telling us, guys, and we, and we have, man, we have people, uh, firefighters and that kind of thing that are, that are out there, even from this church and connected. And so, um, guys, it's, it's just, it's just catastrophic what's happened in Western North Carolina. Um, there are communities that are just absolutely cut off, and um, man, I've, you know, we're, we're in touch with some churches. These trucks out here are going to roll in the morning to uh, Marion, North Carolina, and there's a setup point started, you know, a, a distribution site set up there. So if you didn't get the memo, today we came with, with, without, you know, we wanted to come um, with, uh, not with empty hands, and so if you, if you want to come up, I don't care if it's a bottle of water, um, a case of water, something like that, if you want to come back up here, these trucks are going to be out here all day. Our campuses, um, right now you guys are collecting things in U-Hauls and that kind of thing. We're going to consolidate all that here later today. And there's also some smaller churches that don't really have the means to get the stuff over there, but wanted to collect. So they're going to come today, uh, this afternoon. So it's a big effort. But let's just continue to pray. And man, we got a lot of guys that are downrange, you know, that are, that are uh, from Guilford County that are putting their life on the line day in and day out over the last few days right now, uh, helping rescue people and you know, they're never going to tell you that, you know, but the reality is, I mean, these guys are heroes and they're helping right now. And so we just got a lot we need to keep in prayer um, over this situation. So I'm just going to call upon you to do that. I have been in touch with Brody. Uh, for those of you that are home folks, we planted a church in Waynesville, North Carolina, and I have been in touch with him. They are safe. Uh, I don't think there's been any loss of life in their church. Um, but there has been devastating loss of like everything else for multiple people. So we're going to be in this for a long time and that's fine. That's what the church is. And so these are just initial steps today, but we got some teams going out. I think we got a team leaving Tuesday, another team leaving Saturday already. So, I mean, we're going to be mobilizing for a long time here. Hey, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 11. All right. So, uh, man, let's, let's make a transition here. Let's go to Proverbs 11. I do want to show you guys this picture of the building. Uh, the new building uh, is going up. The reason I want to show you this is because now the building has a sign on it that says Mercy Hill Church, which is important because now people don't assume it's another hospital that's being built. Okay, so... <laughs> Um, but uh, the reason I want to bring that up with y'all is that some of you are newer and we are in a season where it feels like we're going to be talking a lot about the building, the move, what is the Ridge Campus. This is very important for you to understand DNA for Mercy Hill if you are new, okay? That building is a tool. That's all that it is, all right? It's an awesome tool. We praise God for it, but it is a tool. And the tool is not what gets the credit or the glory. The tool is not the exciting part of any job, right? The exciting part is the vision, what it brings. I actually wanted to give you guys a quick illustration of this. So this is actually a shovel from when we did the groundbreaking out there a couple years ago. I, I, um, just happens to be, but just the one I had up here. But you know, when you think about uh, a project that you're doing, the tool is not the exciting part, right? I mean, the exciting part of a shovel is not the shovel. It's the garden project that you've been waiting to do for two years that you finally get to work on, right? It's, it's, your, it's your family going out in the backyard and everybody's got the shovel and they put that first shovel in the ground because you're finally putting in a pool or something like that. This is just the vehicle to get to what the vision is, okay? And the vision for us is not that building. I'm actually gonna hand this off because we propped it back up Thursday and it crashed really loudly halfway through the sermon and scared everybody to death, okay? So... But the, 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 the building is just a tool to get what we actually want to see, which is, man, people saved and baptized and sent to the nations. We want to see more children adopted, more families raised up for foster care. We want to see campuses launched out. Man, we have this big vision at Mercy Hill. We want to see 5,000 people baptized and 500 missionaries sent out, two years or more, uh, by 2032. Those are the things that we get really excited about. That's the vision, okay? Um, the tool is just helping us get there. Now, that building also um, is just going to sit there and be a building and have no life change happen if there isn't a pretty massive team that jumps in over there. And I know this is primarily kind of concerning regional and regional north. So if you're on other campuses today, uh, maybe praying for us. And maybe some of you guys would want to jump in. But generally speaking, if you're a regional north, okay, right now, or you're a regional regular, which is us, okay, or you're in our, over, in our overflow room back in the back over here um, because we're out of space here. Um, we are looking for the largest launch team that we've ever had, 800 people to jump off the sideline on the front line. Without that team, nothing's going to go. It's just going to be a big building that just sits over there and does nothing, okay? But with that team, 
um, than we can have. And there's going to be more ways for you guys to join uh, up with that team. You're going to hear more about that, all right? Proverbs chapter 11. Guys, we're talking about wisdom. Wisdom is being skilled in living well. And that comes from taking God's plan for life very seriously, okay? Um, God has a blueprint. God has a schematic. God has a plan for life. And what he wants is our flourishing. Our joy and flourishing is all bound up in his glory. And, and those two things go together. And, and we get the chance to live life the way that he has designed it. And we got to want to do that. We got to see it as a good thing and want to do it. And that's what this series is all about. Um, I don't know about you guys. If, you, if you're a man in here, you probably have some experience like this, okay? It's two in the morning. It's Christmas Eve. And you're, you're up putting together some godforsaken Barbie dream house, okay? I don't know. Has anybody had that experience, okay? Or, 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 you're, right? or you're putting together some, some kind of crazy thing or it's their birthday or whatever. Now, men have this problem, and I have this problem too, where we have two options. They have a 75-page booklet to tell you how to put it together. Or you can just sort of look at the picture on the box and go for it, right? Who's that? Is that pretty much most? Yeah, okay, exactly, right? And, uh, and the reality is that most of us just look at the picture and go for it. And then what ends up happening is we got 50 pieces left over at the end of the thing and it don't work. And we're like, why do they give me all these extra pieces? It's because they didn't, okay? They all have a place they're supposed to go, but we just don't, right? And, and I think you understand the uh, illustration here. It's like, man, we, we can either sort of look at the box and be like, God, I'm, I'm just going for it, okay? I'm kind of looking at life. I'm just going to go. Or what we can do is say, oh, God, in your kindness and in your grace, you didn't have to do this. But you gave us literature in the Bible that helps us live well. It teaches us things about relationships, marriage. It teaches us things about what we're going to talk about today. Money, generosity, okay? And there's things about uh, life, sexuality. I mean, all these things. And you've given us this. Man, our health, our relationships, our friendships. God is so good to us. Here's what we're going to get into today, all right? And I'm telling you, as soon as I say this, there's going to be some people with like, the, you know, goosebumps and a little bit of like, you know, the hair raising up on the back of your neck because you're like this, I didn't know this was this type of church. Well, okay, we're going to be mature about this. I want to teach you something today that is important, though I have seen it abused. You've seen it abused. We've seen people go too far with this. And yet we're not going to be the type of church that is so scared of heresy that we won't say what is true. Okay. We've got to be mature enough to say what is true, even though we've seen people abuse it. Here's the big idea today. Generally speaking in God's providence, Financial blessing follows financial generosity. If you want the whole sermon in a nutshell, y'all, this is it. What we think is, when I have more, I'll begin to give. And maybe what God's going to tell you today is, the reason you don't have is because you're not giving. You're not, and, I, and listen, if you immediately like, oh my gosh, here we go, church sermon about giving. Take everything I'm going to say and give to somewhere else. Give to the hurricane disaster relief efforts. Give to the pregnancy network, okay? I promise you, the church is doing fine financially. All right, you jumping on or off is not going to make or break us, okay? So, so if, if that's a problem and you're like, I can't stand talking about money in the church, it ain't about church then. You take what I'm talking about with generosity and you give to the North Carolina uh, missions offering. That's going all, I mean, all that stuff's going to Hurricane Helene and all this stuff. All right, so now that that's out of the way, let's actually remove the facade and get down to the heart. Here's the issue. What we see in the Bible is that many times it is our open hands that God blesses. It's hard for God to feel your hands if they're like this. If we're trying to hold on to everything that we got, right? It's hard for God to fill them up and blessing. Now, I know what some of us are going to say. You're going to say, man, I don't like that. That sounds like the prosperity gospel. Actually, y'all, it sounds like the book of Proverbs. Because what we think is, well, I don't like prosperity gospel. Newsflash, I don't either. Telling somebody that ain't got no money, put a thousand dollar, you know, sow a thousand dollar seed on a credit card and God's going to give you back tenfold. That's prosperity gospel. It's evil and wrong. Okay. Uh, telling somebody, hey, if you just follow God, your cows aren't going to die in a rural village. That's evil and wrong. I, I'm not, we're not into that. You, I hope you know we're not into that. But we're also not going to be so scared of going overboard that we refuse to say what is true. Because what is true is that the Bible, in a couple of different places, we're going to look at Proverbs 11 today also mentions this in Malachi, also mentions this, I think, in 2 Corinthians, is that there is a principle in our life that when we are generous, God brings things back in to our life that we might be generous with them again, and he might bless us again. And there's this cycle. Now, it's not a universal promise. There have been people that have been generous their whole life, and they have not experienced some abundance. I understand that. 
But there is a, within the genre of wisdom, which remember, Proverbs aren't promises, okay? They're generally true statements. Within that framework, I think what we need to see is that generally speaking, God blesses those who give. We want to say, when you bless, I'll give. And God is saying, when you give, I will bless you. All right, let's dive in. Proverbs chapter 11. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Now that don't make sense. That's God's math though. You would think, wait, to, to, to have more, I need to hold more. I need to keep it to myself. It's not what it says here. One gives freely, yet grows rich. One should give, but he doesn't. And what happens? Suffers want. Verse 25. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And one who waters himself will be watered. I mean, you guys can see this thing preaches itself. Earlier in this chapter, he says, the kind man is kind to himself. Being kind to others ends up being some kind of blessing that's poured back on you. Now, let's talk about just finances for a second, okay? The Bible, in God's wisdom, in God's grace, has given us much about wisdom and foolishness when it comes to money. All right, the fool, we talked about the sluggard last week. The fool is another character in the book of Proverbs that just says, hey, I want to do life by looking at the box and going for it. I don't want to flip through the thing and see what it actually means to put life together. I just want to go for it. And so they end up doing things like this. Let me give you a few, all right? Fools upgrade their lifestyle continually by more and more credit. Proverbs twenty two twenty six. You know, I don't know if you guys remember this, but layaway used to be a thing. Does anybody remember that? It's not a thing anymore. Now it's credit, credit, credit. And what happens? You buy it on margin and then you buy, by the time you pay it off, it's already broken. You don't even have it anymore, right? Layaway was at least you hold on to, you know, you'll hold off until you, but nope. What does it say? Foolish people, man, upgrade, upgrade, credit, credit. Fools fall for get rich quick schemes. Proverbs 12, 11. They don't want the plotting efforts of the ant of working and storing, working and storing. Instead, it's got to be quick, 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 quick. Fools devour all that they have. Proverbs 20, 20, 21, 20. There is no margin in their life. Whatever, whatever comes into their life, they're going to fill life up to that margin. And, and there's not or, and up to that limit. And there's going to be no margin in their life uh, to be able to breathe. And then it's going to flow into debt and all this kind of stuff. Y'all, Michael Jackson in his career earned $1.1 billion. That ain't investments. That's not net worth. That's earnings. Earned $1.1 billion. You know when he died? He was $400 million in debt. You know what his accountant said? He spent more than he made. <laughs> I guess he did, okay? <laughs> it's just that simple, man. Live on what you make. Okay, there, I mean, all, all this, I mean, hey, the fool gains money by injustice. That's another thing that we see. They want to oppress people all the time. They want to treat people bad. Proverbs eleven twenty six. I could go on. My point is this. The Bible gives us a diet, so to speak, of financial health that you can kind of put in a few smaller buckets. I mean, just generally speaking, I know some of you guys are way ahead on these things and all that, but I mean, generally speaking, it's like, hey, you live on less than you make, all right? You take whatever that difference is and try to invest it in the things that make more money, all right? You stay away from crazy amounts of debt. Listen, this is the point today. And you give money away. You give. Giving is part of the financially healthy life. I don't think we think about it like that. What we don't, we don't think about, what we think is, well, no, you'd want to hold on. That's what's going to bring more. No, something in God's math, and I can't tell you exactly what it is. All I can do is just read from passages like this. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. How does that work? I don't really know. How, how would you know? I don't know. It's, it's God's math. There's something in the margins, the breaks of the game, I and mean, he controls it all, Right? I mean, how many of us right now, I mean, I hope that you have the humility to understand that whatever it is that you have built could be taken like that. I mean, what a weekend for us to understand that together, with all of our brothers and sisters in Western North Carolina. I mean, whatever we have built, whatever we are building, God is in every break of all that. And it could be taken or it could be multiplied tenfold like that. And it's him doing it. So you understand one gives freely yet grows all the richer. It's an acknowledgement of who is actually in control. Is it you? Is it me? Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. I mentioned this earlier. I want to say it in a way if you're taking notes. Guys, God fills open hands. It is very hard for God to bring a bunch of abundance into your life if you're holding on to whatever it is that you got like that, right? 
Instead, what we want to do is give freely. Do you guys know what the old translation? I grew up on the King James Version. You know what it would say? The one who scattereth. It's an image of seed. What, what happens when you scatter seed? You put the seed at risk, but that's the only way to see it multiplied. It's almost, it's almost a little bit reckless when you scatter the seed. And what he's saying is for the believer, the wise person, our generosity, and not just in treasure, right? It's time, it's talent. You see guys sweating it out out here today, loading these trucks up and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's a thousand ways. It's time, it's talent, but yes, it's also treasure. When we scatter those things in generosity, that's when God has an opportunity to do his math and do things in our life that we could never, that we could never understand or believe. You know a good example of where I see this in our church? All right, I want you to think about what we do with our people. Okay, at Mercy Hill, what do we try to do? We try to open our hands with our people. We try to send them out, right? We send them out to the nations. We send them out to other church plants. Think about this, okay? In the last uh, three or four years, we've planted five churches from in the house. This is not partnering with them. These are parent planted. They're our kids, okay? Five of them. Halifax, Nova Scotia, Roanoke, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, Waynesville. We got to pray for them. North Carolina and uh, Tampa, Florida, okay? We have sent out 124 members of the church to go and to launch these churches, so pastor, yes, we got, you know, pastor has come from our church, but then the teams are coming from our church also. And they're, they're you guys. I mean, they're at our campuses. They're, they're in your community groups. They serve with your kids on the weekend. That's who these people are. Can you praise God with me in this? We sent out 124. You know how many are going to worship in those five church plants this weekend? Almost 700. Can we praise God for that? Hey, it's God's math. This is just what we see. You open your hands and you send them out and guess what he does? I don't understand it. I don't know exactly how it works, but some kind of way God breathes upon those open hands and that generosity and he multiplies things and it ain't easy. Y'all, the people that leave to go on a church plant are not people you want to see leave, okay? They're people that you want to stay. I mean, they're the people that are into everything. I mean, there could be some people here that when they go, they're like, I'm gonna go on a church plant. I'm like, good, <laughs> okay, you know, that's great. I'm glad you're going. These, these people are the opposite of that. These people are like, they're serving, they're giving, they're leading groups, they're, you know. So it's not the easiest thing for us as a church to just open our hands. Um, you know, the High Point campus sacrificed immensely to see the church planted in Norfolk. I mean, sent elders, sent staff people, I mean, to that, to that church that's in Norfolk right now. And yet what we see is, what, where would we be if we had just held all that together? Man, we've got six or 700 people worshiping now because of that. It's God's math, that's the point. Look what it says in verse 25. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. That actually means, literally means they will be fattened up. Okay, I mean, think about, you know, thousands of years ago, agrarian society, poor society. What it's saying is, man, you will, you will have enough. You will be fattened up, enriched. And one who waters will himself be watered. Now, this is kind of that principle that we've got to just understand. It's saying it very clearly. There is something about the generous life that God blesses. And that's not bad, that's not icky, that's not slimy, okay? The abuse of it is icky and slimy and evil. But just saying the general principle and having it in our mind, it's not wrong. And some of us might need to get freed up from that today. What we think is, I don't want God blessing me to be any part of my generosity. You're calling that maturity, that's immaturity. Maturity is the ability to take God's word for what it is and wrestle with it and say, God, I want this, this is your plan that you have made. Man, even if this was true, but he didn't want us to know it, he wouldn't have written it down. There is some reason that God has shown us this principle that financial blessing and blessing in our life can follow our generosity. And we don't want to be more spiritual than the Bible here, if you want to put it like that, okay? You don't want to be more pious than the Bible. Actually, we just want to be like right in line with whatever it is that the scripture is calling us to see. I think about this in my life. Um, and, and, you know, our, our year this year is all about deeper for my family. That's our kind of big goal for the year is to finish our deeper commitment to Mercy Hill. I want, I, I want to have that as one of the, uh, you know, reasons that we want to give. Like, man, it's not maybe the main reason. I want to give because I see the mission go forward. I love it. I want to give because I know that if I don't give, I will become an idolater of money. Money can mimic God so good. It's like, it's like if, you, if you don't give it away, man, it will grab your heart. It'll, what, what does C.S. Lewis say? It's got a strange way of knitting a man's heart to the world. So I want to give for that reason. But there's another reason I want to give. You know why? Because the scripture tells us, hey, man, you, you be faithful over little. God might just put you over a lot. And I want to live the biggest life I can, the biggest impact I can. And that means I want to see God give me all the resources that he will. 
And I know that part of a financially healthy life is that we would give. Some of us today, it's like, hey, your physical life, your physical health, right? You, you, eat, you know, eat good, exercise, drink a lot of water, and sleep well. It's, it's pretty simple. I mean, there's other things you can do, but that gets you pretty far down the road. It's the same thing with generosity. It's like, hey, you got, you know, stay away from debt, make more than you spend, uh, you know, invest the difference, and give. How many of us today would be like, hey, I'm going to try to get healthy, but I'm just, I've just decided I'm never going to sleep ever. We'd be like, bud, it don't, it don't really, you can eat really good. You can drink a lot of water. You can exercise. But if you just make a commitment to never sleep, the health that you're looking for ain't going to come. And what I'm telling you from this passage is it seems like there's a part of God's wisdom around money that is saying, man, you want to be financially healthy? then you give some things away and you get in a healthy diet of that. You can say it like this. We give in part, I know it's not the whole, but we give in part to grow our resources by having God fill our open hands. And if we feel icky about that or slimy about that, we're gonna have to grow through that, okay? I want you to think of other areas in your life. Do do you want to reap the blessing of having lived by God's design? Of course you do. Man, you want to reap the blessing of a wonderful marriage by trying to speak to each other in a way that God has intended for us to speak to each other, right? You want to reap the blessing of that relationship. I think about this in my, in my life with my boys. Like I think specifically, I don't know why I have this image of, of just my, my two sons um, in my mind right now, but I just think about them as, as grown people. I mean, they're going to be adults. They're out. They're working. They're, they're living their life. And I just have this picture in my mind of us all sitting by the fire at, at, out by my barn and just talking about life as adults, you know, that they're, they're talking, hey, just talking to them about their families and their kids and marriages and, man, hanging out and talking about their next financial move they're making or maybe they're doing something with their business, talking about God and talking about the church and just sitting with them by the fire. I want that to be a brotherhood in my life one day, even though I'm their father. That is an okay thing to want for all that I'm sowing into them now, sowing discipleship into them now all the time. It's okay to want the blessing of that later. And I don't know what God's going to do, but it's okay to have that in your mind and want it. I would call you to think about money in the same way, man, that we give and we expect. I don't know how this all works, but over the course of my life, God, I believe you're going to bring this back to me. And and, and with that, I'm going to be faithful with whatever it is that you give me again. I think some of us are scared to death because we know there are passages um, like in Matthew 19, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Or, or, you know, we understand like the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And so we're just afraid of money sometimes. And we're afraid of even thinking like, God, I'm, I'm giving. And then I'm secretly thinking that you're going to give some things back to me. And that's part of the reason I give. And I just don't know what to do with that. I'm going to tell you how to reconcile that in your life. You got to understand that money is dangerous. That don't mean it's bad. But handled the wrong way, it can be really bad, bad and dangerous. You know, it's like this. If I said, is nuclear power bad or good? It's like, man, I don't know how to answer that. If you, uh, you know, if it powers an entire city, good. But I watched that mini docuseries, Chernobyl. That seemed bad, okay? (laughs) Nuclear power, right? Money's a little bit the same way. How are we handling it? We can't just go, ah, I'm scared of it. No, no, no. We've got to grow in our understanding of it and grow in this idea of handling things in the way that God would have us. And part of that is giving it away and understanding that he some kind of way in the economy of his kingdom brings things back. Now let's get into this a little more. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched and one who waters himself will himself be watered. I know what you're going to ask and I'm going to try to answer it, but I'm going to tell you the real answer right up front. How does this work? Answer, I have no idea. I don't know. All right. The way I would say it is like this. God's math is just different. It's just different. Some kind of way he multiplies and he's in every break and he's doing these things and it's just different. I saw an article the other day about, um, you know, even people in, the, in, in just the, the medical community, working world, talking about how people that give, man, how much different their life is in terms of satisfaction of life, less depression, more health, longer lives. Like there is just rewards to generosity. And, and the book of Proverbs is bringing that out. There are rewards to generosity. And, and he's saying, hey, this is, this is what it is, okay? All right. Now, you might ask the question, all right, what, um, what are the ways that this actually works and how does it, okay, 
I don't really know, but I'm going to take a shot. I'm going to give you four ways I think maybe some of this stuff can work out. Just, just, they're just kind of wisdom, but maybe you'll, maybe you'll agree with some of these. Ultimately, I'm not totally sure. But I think these make sense to me. And I got some of this from Rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, who wrote a book called um, Thou Shalt Prosper, Ten Commandments of Making Money. And he talks about how rooted in Jewish customs and society are things that are good when it comes to money, like an inherent uh, goodness in business and knowing the numbers and giving money away and all that kind of stuff. And so I got some of the stuff from him. But but here, here's what I would say, all right? Number one, giving motivates us to want to make more money. You get around a veteran Christian, I'm telling you, I'm not saying that's all they think about. Don't get too more spiritual than the Bible here, okay? They may have something in their mind that they want to have a mountain house one day, or maybe they want to have a new car, or maybe they want to, I'm not saying they don't have any of that in their life, but you get around a veteran believer, and I promise you one of the biggest motivations they have for wanting to make more money is they got stuff they want to give money to. They're just excited about it, man. They got stuff going on around the world. They got projects. They got things. They're excited about the church. They see a disaster like this, and they're like, man, where is the give link? Because I'm going to do that today. They want to be able to do that. And I understand that. that. And what happens? When you got more motivation, maybe you get out there and make more money, right? Um, I think about this in me and Anna's life. Me and Anna, um, I, you know, we've had this on our, on our mind for a while. One day, I don't know when it'll be, one day, I have a goal of giving at the founder level to the pregnancy network. Um, the, the, the cause of life and all that is just so bound up in my heart, and I feel like it's a good mission. And, I mean, that's $20,000, just to be frank with you. That's a, that's a big gift, <laughs> right? And I don't know when that'll happen, but I'm telling you, having that fixed in my mind as a goal that one day I'm you know, circling in prayer, and one day I'm going to check that box, you think it makes me want to be wiser with whatever it is that we have now? So wanting to give is a good motivation. The second motivation, uh, or the second thing I think it helps us with, Giving teaches us to live on less than we make. Man, if you got real serious about giving, you cannot give what you don't have. And if you don't have, because you're continually spending more than you have and going into debt and all this kind of stuff, right? And so I think one thing is it teaches us to, to try to live within our means, you know, and, and, uh, and, and be able to have margin to be able to give away. Two more, real quick. Giving motivates us to look at the numbers. You know, a lot of people have really tough time in their financial life, and it's because they don't know what is happening. Once you've done mortgage and there's insurance and then you got this reimbursement check for something and next thing you know, it's like, man, I, I just don't even know where all this is going. I don't know where it's coming, going, all that kind of stuff. We have, I mentioned this later, you know, we, we really push people to at least when they're at some point in their life do Financial Peace University. You may not agree with every single thing in it or whatever. I'm not saying that, but it's a good framework to try to get some things around budgeting and all that. Proverbs says in Proverbs 27, 23, know the condition of your flock. Man, we need to know what's going on. <laughs> And, with our, and, and if you're giving money away, I bet you, you kind of know, because you got to know what can I give, you know, all that kind of stuff. The last thing I would say is this, giving leads to generosity in other areas of your life and being a generous person makes other people want to do business with you. Okay. Um, I, you know, a lot of the self-help genre of books, which I, which I'm fine with, I like, I'm mean, a lot of the, they really come down to a few core principles. One of them is be very concerned with helping other people and that will come back to you. I mean, can't you just smell greed on somebody? Can't you just get in a, a relationship? Maybe you got a salesperson or you're working with somebody or whatever, and you just can feel on them like, man, they're just here to get over on me because they want to get their thing done. And then how much opposite is that when you get to working with somebody in business or whatever, and you can really genuinely sense on them that they want both parties to just come out awesome. They want it for you. They're not trying to crush you. They want you to do good. They want them to do good. And it just makes all the difference. And I think that generous spirit makes people want to come in and do business with you more, you know? And I think maybe some kind of way it helps. Look, those are four ways that maybe God is using generosity to enrich people. Um, but truthfully, I don't know how he does it, okay? I don't know. It's, it's uh, man, it's God's math, but he does it. You know, I got a, a good story here, and then we'll get into the application. Um, we got a good friend in this church that got saved a little bit later in life, and he was an accountant. And, um, and he was, it was funny, he, he was, you know, he was trying to learn the Christian faith. And one of the doctrines of Christianity, like we're saying, we give money away and we, uh, you know, we believe that's part of a, a financially healthy life. But he was like, God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You don't need my money. <laughs> you know, you've already got plenty. And so he kind of had that. And he was trying to work through that and learn. But here's what happened. He was an accountant. You know what he kept finding over and over and over? He kept seeing, man, these, these people that I'm doing all their taxes the people that are giving money away, they just seem blessed. I don't know how else to describe it. They're just blessed. 
it's like, you know, they, 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 they shine some kind of way. I don't know exactly how it all works, but for him, it was kind of like this. He came to this moment in his Christian life after looking at all the books and, and all the people he was helping. And he said, man, I can't afford not to give because the blessing of God rests some kind of way and follows some kind of way people that are willing to be generous with their time, talent, and treasure, all right? Here's the application for this weekend. Y'all give and be blessed. Give and be blessed. Man, I know that that can sound like it's right on the line. It is a little bit on the line, but it don't sound like prosperity gospel. It's the book of Proverbs, okay? And we need to not be so scared of the heresy that we can't say what is true. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do fear that way. We're going to do what is true. And what is true is that some kind of way, our financial, our financial well-being and all of that, it's tied up in the way that we are generous. Now, here's the problem. And I said this in the very beginning. And so as we start moving toward a close, I'm going to say it again, okay? Some of us think, and here's what we say. We say, God, when God blesses me, I will give. And God says, give, and I will bless you, okay? Many times we say, when God blesses me, I will give. But God says, give, and I will bless you. This, is, this, is, this goes down to the absolute core of the concept of faith, y'all. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of what is not seen. Here's what we want faith to be. Listen, this is very important, okay? Many times we want faith to be like this. God, you move in a big way, prove something to me, then I'll believe you, okay? And then I will move my feet and act in accordance with whatever it is. So you do something awesome, make me believe you, I'll believe you, and then I'll act. Y'all, that ain't faith. Faith is the opposite of that. Faith is, God, I believe you on the front end. I believe you here, and then Based on what I believe, I'm going to take action. And then some kind of way in the economy of God, that belief and that action and God reacts and responds. And, he get, and, and that's when he moves. You believe, you act, then we see God move. Hey, I know not, you guys are all at different campuses out there um, today, but if you're right here, okay, right, right here in the sound of my voice, you are sitting in a real life example of that. Let me tell you how. Okay, remember, believe, act, see God move. Man, we believed in, the, in what God was doing in this church so much. Ten years ago, we had, uh, we had launched in a Burr Mill Park. We had moved over to the, where the kids' space is. Now that was our whole church. was just where that kids' space is. Four services a day, running a 1,000 people, people sitting on the floor. I was preaching myself to death. I mean, it was just this, it was, you know, and we needed a bigger space. We needed to double the size. And so this came up, on, and, and we had to grab it, this, this space you're sitting in right now. The problem is we had no money, Okay which is a problem, all right? Not an insurmountable one, apparently, because we're here we are. Me and Pastor Bobby go out, still have no idea how this works. I mean, we're praying, God, we believe you're in this. We're just gonna beat the door down and act, act, act. Believe, act, then we're gonna see if you move. And you know what we did? Some kind of way we got out there and we convinced these contractors to start building this place before we had ever raised a dime. I don't know, how, I don't know why they did it, okay? But they did. And then, and then, you know what, when it came time, believe, act, when it came time for the church to kind of fund what was happening here, all the experts said, man, your church is nothing but college students and young professionals. Y'all can probably give about $600 to this project. The church gave $1.2 million to the project. It's actually how we launched the Clifton Road Campus because then this place filled up and we needed something else to do, okay? My point is, believe, act, see God move. You know, I think about uh, me and Anna, uh, when, when it came time for us to get on the list for adoption. So we, we, had, we had gone through a whole year worth of the adoption process, um, filling out paperwork and all that. We got all everything. We're ready to go, okay? All you got to do is put your name on the list. Now, two things happen when you put your name on the list. You're eligible to receive a child as soon as it happens, okay? But um, when that happens, you got as soon as they call you, you got to pay the rest of the money for the adoption, which was like $20,000. We had just come out of a, a, you know, an initiative here and build a house and all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, we, I remember we kind of, you know, prayed across the kitchen table one night like are we going to put our name on the list or are we going to wait till all that money is in the barn you know so to speak and then put our name on the list and we made the decision together God we feel like you're in this and by the way they said it would probably take like a year and a half once you're on the list so we kind of felt like we might have had time anyway so we just went for it and we decided hey we're going to do it we're going to we're going to put our name on the list of course they called us faith Ann was here six weeks later okay believe act and you know what? It was one of the greatest times in our life to see God move. I mean, I mean that, the, the adoption got funded like that. And it was not for me standing up here and saying anything about it. Nobody even knew. I mean, that wouldn't have. I'm just talking about different areas. And, man, God just did some crazy stuff. And now Faith Ann is in our home. My point is this. 
Many times in our life, what we want to do is the opposite of what God is calling us to do here in this moment. And I want to close talking about the gospel here, okay? Because I know this. Some of us are thinking to ourselves, man, I get what you're saying, and I even sort of believe it. That illustration about like I'm going to eat right, I'm going to, you know, drink a lot of water, and I'm going to exercise, but I'm never going to sleep. Maybe that kind of pops for you, and you're like, okay, yeah, generosity is, I don't care if it's, you know, $10 a month that you get in a rotation of, man, I'm going to give, I'm going to give, I'm going to do something to not let this just be about me, right? Um, but you're thinking, I just don't know if I can do it, man. That's, I feel like there's just a, a heart posture here that I don't know if I can get to that place, whether it's giving to Mercy Hill or, or giving to something else in the community. Okay, well, you know what? The gospel really helps us with this because here's what we see in the gospel. You ready? Believe, act, see God move. Man, who is the mo- who, what is the epitome of that? It's Jesus Christ coming to, from heaven to earth for us. Okay, because here's what he did. Jesus Christ, and I, I, understand, um, that, that I understand the Trinity, and I understand that, that Jesus is God, but in a sense also he is praying to his Father about what the mission is. He submitted himself to the Father. Okay, and so what Jesus does is he goes from heaven to earth. He believes God for this mission, empties himself, was rich, becomes poor, goes from heaven to a manger, But what is he trusting God to do? And this is the point, okay? What is he trusting God to do? He is trusting him to give over the inheritance to Christ, which is the nations. Here's what that means. Here's what that means. Jesus is trusting God, heaven to earth, empty myself, scatter, open myself. But what am I believing God is going to do in return? All of us that are believers, that are Christians. A people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. See, Jesus, and so here's the thing. If you're like, man, I don't know if I can trust God like that. Your very salvation is proof that God will bless when we open our hands because he did it for Christ and he will do it for us, all right? And so so let me just say this and I'll be done, okay? All right, so a couple different groups of people here. You're here today and you're like, man, I hear this, but the walls are still just up. I'm not doing this, church, money grab. I'm not talking about money in church and all that kind of stuff, okay? Okay. I want to try to put my finger on that for just a second. I'm going to tell you something. Is it really that? Or is there some other stuff going on in your life that you just don't want to let, let, let sort of, you know, come out? Um, I remember one time we were discipling a young guy here at Mercy Hill. He was, he was just kind of taking steps in the faith. He was a little bit younger guy, wor- I mean, working full time, all that. And, and he always would talk about money and church. Man, I can't stand it when preachers talk about money. I can't stand money in church. Can't stand money in church. Not going to give to a church. And I would listen to this all the time. And I heard it many times. And finally, one day sitting over at Mellow Mushroom, I absolutely just had enough. And, I t- and here's what I did. I took a pen out, I took a napkin, and slid it across the table. And I said, hey, man, I know you'll never give to a church. Money grab, all that, got it. Why don't you write down two or three other things that you do give to in your life? Because me, m- me and my wife might want to join you in that. I'm going to tell you, you ain't never seen a bigger set of eyes in your life. Because the issue had nothing to do with money in church. And the issue had everything to do with the stingy heart. He was giving to absolutely nothing. And I have found that to be true, man. It's like, I don't want to talk about money in church. I don't want to talk about money in church. Well, what do you give to? At what level do you give to it? How consistently do you give to it? Is it about money in church? (laughs) Or is it really just about like, man, I ain't giving to nothing, you know? And so this is what I want to tell you today. Hey, don't allow those walls to go up. Man, allow the spirit to do some convicting today. If it's got to be, don't do it, don't do it to the church then. Give it to something else, okay? That's fine. But start somewhere in your life. Man, I don't care if it's $10 a month. Man, sign up. Let that be drafted. Get, give somewhere in your life and see the blessing of generosity. And then the last thing I want to say is this. Malachi 3.10, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for your, you a blessing until there is no more need. I'm going to challenge you today. Some of you in here right now, okay, I'm going to challenge you. All right? It's, giving is part of the financially healthy life. It's part of God's design. Man, if we refuse to give, we might as well be looking at the picture on the box trying to do life rather than taking what God has given us in terms of his manual. And for some of us, it's time to take a step up in that giving because you can, and, and, and maybe maybe that that blessing that you're looking for is just on the other side of that. We use this generosity ladder at Mercy Hill. It's just a helpful thing. What we say is initial giver, this is somebody who tips God. Every once in a while they come, they want to give a little bit. It's so much better than nothing in your life, but 
Second one is consistent giver. It's like, man, I'm giving on a monthly basis or some kind of rhythm in quarterly, whatever it is, but it's not at the level of an intentional giver. An intentional giver is a tither. Give 10% of my income. People are like, was that before taxes or after taxes? Man, if that's really the question, I think we're missing the point, okay? I mean, the, the, it's just like, man, it's a tithe, okay? It's a 10%. And, uh, and, then, and then this is what I want to challenge you. Hey, some of you guys, it's time to move from there into sacrificial legacy. God has blessed you with much. And here's what we think. We think, well, God's blessed me with much. I'm going to give. But what might God be about to unleash in your life if you would take those steps of faith? Man, that he is calling upon you to, to take, right? Let's pray. Father, we come before you and Lord, we just ask right now that you would move in our hearts. God, turn us into generous people. Lord, and then bless us accordingly. Father, I pray that this church would be one who is pouring out constantly in our time, in our talent, in our treasure. And Lord, I pray that our hands would be open and that you would fill us with, with, uh, with abundance that can only come from you. In Christ's name, amen.